Thank you very much. Is the mic on? It's, yeah. Thank you very much. And, and not only thank you, Huma, for the invitation. It's, uh, it's at the right time to congratulate you for the excellent meeting you organized, you and, and the team here in, in the Middle East with uh, Frank and Alberto and Barbara, Laura, Anna, as now the whole team. I think you, you did a great job, and, and I am very happy to be part of this meeting. Thank you so much. So the topic uh, that we will cover now, I will try to be brief because it's the end of the day. It's a hot topic. And I think it's hot because it's exciting, but we don't have a lot of knowledge yet. And it's whether the microbiota is important for what we're doing, for the IBF success. And it, it goes back to the endometrium, which is known as the black box of, of reproduction. We have very uh, little understanding of, of endometrial receptivity. And we think we're getting better, but still there are many ways uh, to investigate this. And I'll try to cover this briefly. The concept of endometrial receptivity, uh, you are quite familiar with it. There are only a few days that the embryo will attach to the endometrium. Then, uh, I mean, it's quite uh, strict, and if you put an embryo in any day of the cycle, it will not implant unless it's only those two or three days where there will be a nice dialogue between both of them. So the way we could think of it is that the, the, the embryo and the endometrium have to attach to each other. And this endometrium could be uh, a teflon some days, so it will never attach. And some of the days will be like a Velcro. It will just attach to the endometrium. So we have uh, very few days which we consider the endometrium a Velcro, and a lot of days that we have a teflon that they will, it will just slide right and will never, never implant. So the classical ways to, um, to study this endometrial receptivity, and, and you remember the time we used to do biopsies and look at the histology with the noise criteria from the 50s and the immunohistochemistry and some proteins that we were looking then. Then we had the ultrasound, and then the Doppler came on top of it, and even the hysteroscopy. These are classical ways of doing things. Then we had the transcriptomics that in the last few years have been making quite a lot of noise, and you have heard about the ERA and, and similar tests that are being developed. New things are coming, like the secretomics that are still being developed, uh, and now the microbiota is like the new kid in town, and we will see what we know about it. But most likely, we will need not all of them, but quite a few of them, not only one of them. We have heard a lot in this meeting about individualization and personalized medicine, and, and we do individualize almost anything in the follicular phase, about the, the medication we're going to give the patient. We look at the viral reserve. We look at the BMI, the age. We decide on the protocol where we do IVF or whether we do ICSI how we treat these embryos in the lab, how many embryos do we transfer, and then we just put the embryos in the uterus and treat everyone similarly. And, and we know this is not the right way to do. And um, Barbara Lawrence explained yesterday and today, and, and Jim Fratini as well, that the luteal phase is also very important because things do change, but until very recently, this was completely neglected. Everyone was treated exactly the same. And we know that embryo transfer can be personalized and we use the knowledge from technology. We use technology for many things. This is a simple example. This is uh, in 1956, how they had to transport uh, um, five megas. And they had to put this machine in a plane to transport five megas of information. Today, you can put here, in, uh, not today, this is 2011, 256 gigabytes. So this is like 50,000 times more. So things are moving very quickly, and, and this is what I try to uh, transfer to you, that we have to be aware of this new language and this new technology, not to believe everything we read, but to be critical. And the only way to be critical is to understand what we read. So we have to get into this language of the omics that for the scientists in the room and the embryologist probably is closer, but for clinicians like me, it's a bit far away, and we have to make the effort to try to understand what we read, and then we will be able to see what this transcriptomics means or what is the protein or the metabolism trying to tell us. And by that transcriptomic experience, we were able to understand how ERA works and how some of these women have receptive endometrium here. It would be pre or post receptive. And some women, about 10% of them, they may have a, a displaced window of implantation. It could be post receptive, it could be pre receptive, and even some women they have a, a very narrow window of implantation. So this is new information that we're getting and is helping us to improve what we do. But then we have to say, is this clinically relevant? Which is, at the end of the day, what we want to know. This is the classical question, so what? So is this applicable to my patients? 
So this is uh, uh, information about the microbiome project that started uh, a few years ago. And there was a big project trying to investigate this a few years uh, that was uh, uh, published in Nature. And it was very interesting because when you look at the numbers, it's quite surprising that our body contains tenfold more microbes than human cells, which is strange. We, we don't think we, we have so much body mass made of bacteria, but this is how we, how we are. So about two to six pounds of our body is made of bacteria. But we need these bacteria, it's good bacteria. So a lot of research has gone into this, what is called second human genome, and has been linked to many diseases, like uh, diabetes, or uh, immune, autoimmune diseases, or muscular dystrophy, or sclerosis, even cancer. And we very recently published this review in, in RBM Online about what we should know about microbiome. Because it's a, it, as I said, it's a very hot topic. If you put microbiome into PubMed, you will find 46,000 hits. And if you type microbiome in Google, then you will go up to seven million probably today. So it's a lot of people working on this topic nowadays. How you study the microbiota, there are different ways of taking the sample and doing the, the functional analysis, which is mainly uh, metabolomics. You can do genomic analysis, which is the, the major way we do the, uh, the analysis of the microbiota today, especially to the 16S uh, ribosomal subunit. Or you could do uh, high uh, through output culturing and, and trying to go to whole genome sequencing. But mainly we will stay here in the genomic analysis and gene sequencing of this specific subunit that may be different from one bacteria to the other. This project uh, that started a long time ago, more than 10 years ago by the NIH, they, they analyzed uh, almost 5,000 specimens in 242 adults, male and female, and they ended up taking 18 uh, samples from women and 15 in men, so obviously they were taking three from the vaginal sites, and they tried to investigate if this bacteria, from the molecular point of view, they cluster together in the different sites, and they did cluster. You can see how these are the oral uh, microbiota, close to the nasal, close to the skin, here the urogenital and the GI tract. So yes, you can identify the microbiota in different areas, clearly. So from there, they jump into linking this altered microbiota with different diseases, and there are plenty of publications in good journals, especially with diabetes and cardiovascular disease. You can find even books today about the microbiota. And probably you will remember uh, this paper from Nature Medicine uh, not so long ago, in 2016, uh, trying to replace the microbiota in babies that were born through C-section, because babies who are born through C-section, sometimes they have, they're more prone to some infections. So what they were doing is taking the microbiota from the vagina of the mother and putting it in the mouth of the baby and trying to normalize the microbiota in the gut of, this, of these infants. So this is a, a very interesting area for, for research, no doubt. So what do we know today? What is known about, uh, the, this is vaginal microbiota, because we will differentiate between vaginal and endometrium. And this is vaginal, vaginal microbiome of healthy women. So if you take healthy women, this is almost 400 patients, and here you have all the different bacteria that is being determined by gene sequencing. They're looking at this 16S subunit. And if you look at the uh, bacteria that are most uh, predominant, you have the Lactobacilli crispatus and Lactobacilli inner, is probably like the, the most popular ones in the vagina. But again, and as we have heard yesterday and today, you have ethnic variations, which is quite interesting. And you can see in this uh, vaginal bacterial communities how you have differences, whether the patients are from Asian or uh, white European or blacks or Hispanics, and they will have different distributions of this microbiota. So what is normal for one patient may not be so normal for the next patient, and we have to take this into consideration. The truth is that you have a low lactobacilli, you have a higher risk of chlamydia infection, you have three times high risk of HPV infection, and three times high risk of HIV. So there's a correlation with disease, no doubt. And the new paradigm is that the uterus that we always considered it was esterile is not really esterile. Probably bacteria does not grow in the conventional way we grow bacteria, but when you look at the bacteria through molecular uh, biology, you will find in this upper genital tract bacteria that comes from the vagina. This is 
uh, they Nugent the score, the way they look at this, this is the bacteria again, and the darker the color, the higher the concentration. And you can see how the upper genital tract is not sterile at all. You will find uh, some bacteria, mainly, again, Lactobacilli inus, Crispatus, and Prevotella, and, and more or less they correlate quite well with the uh, vagina population. Again, this is the uh, American Journal of Statistics and Gynecology publication in 2015, and you can see in blue the vaginal population, and in red, the upper genital tract, so you can see that they correlate pretty well. So it seems that they move from the vagina to the uterus in what we consider previously esteral areas. What about endometrial microbiome? Can we detect it? And it can be done. This is one of the first papers, 2016, looking at endometrial, not vaginal, endometrial microbiome. And this comes from uh, Richard Scott's group, from Jason Franasek again. And you can see that in the tip of the catheter, you can characterize as you can see here again in this list of bacteria, the bacteria that we can detect in the uterus. And it's quite interesting how this is a continuum. This is a paper from Nature from last year. And you can see that if you take the sample in the vagina or in the cervix, or if you go up in the uterus, even the fimbria, or even in the pouch of Douglas, you see how this bacteria changes, but it's actually a continuum from the vagina moving all the way up to the uterus, to the fimbria, and to the um, peritoneum. And it does change across the cycle. Here you can see in red the estradal concentration. This is the classical rise of estradal, and then the luteal phase estradal. You have the progesterone in blue. And in black, you see the population. This would be the, the, <coughs> um, the communities, the, the, bacteria, the vaginal bacterial communities, how they modulate and they change according to the hormonal value. So it's not stable throughout the month. So some of these um, um, altered vaginal microbiome has been correlated with poor reproductive outcome, and this was one of the first papers published by the group of Peter Humaydan in Denmark, where uh, Professor Klaus Andersen works as well. And they looked at the vag bacterial vaginosis, which is quite frequent in infertile women, about one in five more or less. The problem of having a bacterial vaginosis, as you know, you move from acidic environment to a, a not so acidic environment with, with Gardnerella vaginalis, which is anaerobic. Most of the times produces no symptoms, so the patient will not notice. But it's linked to preterm birth, it's linked to post-surgical infections, and maybe to infertility. So they look at the uh, bacterial vaginosis with the classical Amsel criteria or with the Nugent criteria, taking a, a, a gram stain smear, or with qPCR doing, doing these microbiome studies. And they found that when you have normal vaginal uh, microbiota, the biochemical pregnancy rate and the clinical pregnancy rate were significantly higher than when the woman had abnormal vaginal microbiota, which had a, a much lower chances of success. Again, these are limited numbers, but, but quite interesting, trying to correlate altered microbiota with poor reproductive success. So this generated a lot of debates. This is uh, one of the sections, views and reviews from fertility and sterility. It's a set of four publications, uh, the introduction is by Carlos Simon. And the question was, does, do, do microbes in the female reproductive function matter? And they did this study, this is published by Inma Moreno from, from Valencia in Spain, and they published in the American Journal of OBGYN two years ago, interesting data taken at the same time than ERA. So they were looking at endometrial biopsies and endometrial fluid taken by aspiration, and they, they tried to correlate this with the microbiota again. So one of the things that they found, this is endometrial fluid and this is vaginal aspirate, that they are not exactly the same. The, population of bacteria in one side or the other is very similar, is correlated, but is not exactly the same. You can see that when you have a lactobacilli-dominated flora, the chances of a live birth are significantly higher. When you have a, a non-dominated but lactobacilli flora, you have high chances of miscarriage or non-pregnancy. So in blue, you, you would see the lactobacillus. So it seems that the, the more lactobacilli you have in the vagina or in the endometrium at this time, the better the outcome. In fact, when we look at the numbers, and again, we have to take them with caution because numbers are small, but these are uh, difficult patients that had a lactobacilli-dominated microbiota, and this would be non-lactobacilli-dominated microbiota. You can see that the pregnancy rate per transfer was significantly better in the, where the lactobacilli were abundant. They had a higher implantation, higher ongoing pregnancy rate, lower miscarriage, and obviously higher live birth rate for transfer. So this was quite exciting at the beginning. 
But what are we missing here? We are correlating what we see with the outcome. But we're missing two things. One is, are we able to change this microbiota by giving uh, probiotics? Because when you hear about these stories, the next question is, what should I give to my patients? So if I give uh, <coughs> probiotics to the patient, is, am I going to change the population, the bacterial, uh, the vaginal bacterial communities? And the second is, if I change by do, giving probiotics to my patient, am I going to change the outcome? Am I going to improve this poor outcome? And there's no data still for this. But we did the first, uh, one of the first studies that we presented in ASRM a few months ago in, in Denver, in Colorado. And it was a randomized, double-blind, and placebo-controlled trial to see if we were able to change this microbiota. So we gave these uh, probiotics to young fertile donors and we were trying to see by putting this probiotic in the vagina, we could actually change the, the community of bacteria. And as you can see here, the, the lactobacillus rhamnosus, which is one of the most needed to have a healthy uh, microbiota, you see in red the placebo and in, in green the probiotics. Uh, we analyze at different time points and you can see that actually that microbiota changes with the administration of the probiotic. <clears throat> if you do a cluster analysis, you can see how, again, this population that received the medication is different from this population that clustered different. So, so yes, we can change the microbiota in cases alter. What we don't know yet if is, is this is going to have an impact on the outcome of the cycle. <clears throat> Recently, you will find papers trying to link the microbiota with endometriosis, with gynecological cancer, with chorioamnonitis, even with preeclampsia. And I'll just give you to finalize a couple of slides on chronic endometritis, which is something that we also uh, have to um, um, deal with on a daily basis. And there's a lot of inconsistency there. And, and we can benefit again from technology to have a better diagnosis and trying to do a better job with our patients. Again, the paper comes from the same group. It was published in the American Journal of OBGYN this particular year. And what they tried is to diagnose a molecular tool uh, to, to be able to understand if this is better than the classical methods to diagnose chronic endometritis. The problem with the classical methods is that there is a huge inconsistency. You have people who will look at history, they get biopsy, and they will look at the CD138. People that will do a hysteroscopy, and according to me, to the image, they will say, yes, this is or this is not chronic endometritis. You have the classical culture of microbes, or you have uh, molecular biology, RT-PCR. And you can see how inconsistent this could be, because here you have no CD138, the hysteroscopy is negative, but then you have positive culture and positive RT-PCR, or just the opposite, negative, positive, and positive here, or positive in the hysteroscopy, but not in the CD138 or in the culture. So again, there's a huge inconsistency there. And in fact, in those classical methods, the agreement is only 20%. However, when you <coughs> use the molecular uh, microbiology versus the ones that agree, the ones in white here, that, uh, sorry, the ones in white that they completely agree, you try to mimic this with molecular microbiology and the agreement is almost 80%. So it seems that by using, again, technology, we will have a much better accurate diagnosis of a chronic endometritis. So to conclude, I think, that we have clear that endometrial factor is responsible for about one in four cases of failed implantation. Still, the embryo is the main player in the failed implantation, but we cannot forget about endometrium. Personalized medicine is moving forward, and we have heard a lot of these things uh, in the last uh, two days. The percentage of lactobacilli, uh, together with the specific pathogens, are significant variables to predict this reproductive success. And the evaluation of the endometrial factor may expand from the classical morphology or molecular analysis to today microbiology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Juan. Any questions for Professor Garcia Palasco? Please. <coughs> Thank you very much for the very informative lecture. So we've been using um, the locally available lactobacilli probiotics for our patients, but this contains a is trial component in it. So we are very, very worried to use it in the current cycle. We don't use any of them because this is only research. 
So we, we don't have a, a magic recipe. Is this working? It's not working, right? I can answer. It's working? It's working. Oh, okay, okay. See, uh, what I'm trying to say is that all of this is before we start using it in patients. Before we give it to patients, we have to understand what we are doing because the problem with diagnosing alter microbiota is what do you do after that? Because if this is like, like the story of vitamin D, if you don't measure, you're happy. If you measure vitamin D and it's low, then you have to treat. So if you do a test for microbiota and it tells you that it's altered, then you have to treat the patient. And there's no data showing that you can treat the patient with a benefit. So what do we do today? We are just doing research. We try to first this randomized trial to see if by putting the probiotic, it really changes the bacterial uh, communities, and it does change. Now, what we don't know is, is by doing this, we can improve the outcome. There's no data on that. So we don't give probiotics in general to our patients unless they are undergoing a, a, a trial. So in your trial, did you give this probiotics during the cycle or before the period or at the time? This was during the stimulation because the life of these probiotics is very short. So we started on the day of the, uh, when they start the stimulation, when they're finishing the period, and we continued all the way. And it was quite interesting to see because we use antibiotics for the pickup. Once you give the oral antibiotic, the whole microbiota just drops down and disappears. So this is something that we should consider. Why do we use antibiotics for the pickup that not many people use? Thank you. Yes, please, Dr. Gagash. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting lecture. Actually, I am, uh, I, I've been doing checking the endometrium for certain patients, not all patients. Some patients who uh, would come with chronic, um, with suspected chronic endometritis, like patients with recurrent miscarriage, especially the second trimester miscarriage. And I used the, um, the old method, which I was uh, taking the endometrial biopsy and checking for the plasma cells and also culture. I got some positive results with the treating these patients. But then I started using the Emma and Alice that is uh, provided by EV. And they suggested some patients to use uh, probiotics, vaginal fissary. But uh, some patients, um, I just used it on very few patients. Um, but I don't know, I mean, the timing that we should give the, uh, this vaginal fissaries, which is a gynecloring UAE. Um, I'm using it just before the embryo transfer. Um, I just use it for a few patients, so that's the question. Mm. If it's said research, then why it is um, it's on the market? Thank you. That's a good question, and we should have someone here from iGenomics to explain it. <laughs> But the truth is that we, we need to move forward. I mean, there are things that we don't know. We need, we need, uh, we need to answer some questions. So I agree with you that we have a test in the market that doesn't have a proper treatment yet. It's just speculation. But then we have to do something with the patients. We have to do something. And, and I know because uh, um, there are many of these probiotics already in the market, and some of them are being developed with a proper design from other companies. And actually, I'm involved in one of these uh, trials trying to understand if what we're doing has any impact or not. The problem with probiotics is that the way they are developed in the market is not like a drug. It, you, can, you can put a probiotic in a supermarket and you can sell it. There is no, no control like if it was a proper medication. So in the future, and this is in the near future, we'll have to try to understand that probiotics are not the same. And some of them have a high concentration of, of uh, bacteria and will be very useful, whether it's biannual or oral. And some others may have nothing, but they are sold as probiotics. So again, there will be a quality of them. And then we have to first understand if we are changing the, the flora in these chronic endometritis patients that you mentioned, and if by giving this medication, we are going to have any impact. Because what we saw is that the, the half-life is very, very short. So we have to give them daily. We have to give them during the stimulation and most likely until around the time of implantation that that's when things may happen one key question here is and this is what we're doing right now because this study was done with vaginal probiotics is if this medication is as effective taken orally that most likely they will be because there is some evidence with other areas of medicine where they use oral probiotics they will reach the gut and from the gut they will move to the to the endometrium but still this is pure speculation, so I cannot say use this or this dose or these days because there's no data about it. A question here? Do you want to? I, I want to ask if there is any correlation between the endometrial uh, myob, uh, 
bacterial and uh, the chromosomal anomaly in the embryo. Yeah, it will affect the embryo to uh, lead to chromosomal abnormality. Um, well, that, that would be difficult to, um, to understand. I think the main mechanism of that, of that the microbiota may interfere with the embryo would be in the attachment, in the early phase of addition, or maybe in the invasion. But if the embryo comes with a, a proper chromosomal um, number, it shouldn't be changed by the altered microbiota from my point of view. The problem is that this microbiota may alter the environment that facilitates the inflammation and the, and the implantation of the embryo. So I, I doubt that there will be a connection between one and the other. My question is, uh, do we know any cause of this alteration in the uh, flora? Is it like uh, lifestyle? Is it uh, diet? Is any relation? Or not, no study was done for that? Yeah, it's an excellent question because we could thought it change the lifestyle and no need for probiotics. That would be ideal. And it's linked to many things. It's linked to stress. It's linked to the diet. It's linked to the um, um, exercise. But there's no clear answer again. All of this, I think, it just jumped very quickly into the scientific world with very little understanding. We used to put microbiology in the medical school and, and you know, in the 60s or in the 70s when people were doing cultures. And then, because it didn't help us, we didn't use it anymore. Now it's coming back because of the molecular technology. But this is, again, the question. The, the fact that we are able to identify differences doesn't mean that these differences are bad. Maybe they have to be there. So now they link the alter microbiota with disease, or in our particular case, with infertility. Are we able to change that, or we will not be able to change it? No one knows. No one did the trial. And, and I know there are a lot of people looking into this aspect, not only in a descriptive study, that these are the ones that I presented, but a, in the intervention. I mean, if there is any mechanistic way of improving what was wrong by changing the flora and then having a better outcome. And maybe the, the, the way to change that, as you said, is not only putting probiotics to normalize the flora and putting the right bacteria. Maybe it's, it's before that, yeah? Maybe two more short questions, short answers, please. Yeah, um, um, I was going to ask you about, uh, so, so. Um, we used uh, things to, like immunosuppression or immunomodulation, um, corticosteroids and uh, IgA uh, kind of uh, during the uh, luteal phase or before that. Do you think potentially we are harming the patients by doing that? Because it may lead to overgrowth of, uh, of certain bacteria in the... That's a good question because actually immune suppression during the luteal phase, uh, most of, if not all the times, it's useless. Why? Because we need inflammation. If infl inflammation does not happen, implantation will not happen. It's an inflammatory process. Only if the patient has an autoimmune disease, that's when maybe, may, and I say maybe, it could be useful. But in the rest of the patients, giving immune suppression may do more damage than good. And in this particular case, it's like giving antibiotics for the retrieval. Maybe we should not give antibiotics for the retrieval because this is going to completely disrupt the, the vagina microbiota. And same with, with immune suppression. So that's a very good point. Um, with regards to a recurrent implantation failure, so chronic endometritis seems to be one of the main causes nowadays. Um, how do we diagnose it? I mean, is it going to be a blind culture or aspiration, or are we going to do a hysteroscopy to do the diagnosis? And when should we do the hysteroscopy? I mean, I saw that it fluctuates throughout the cycle. Hmm. Uh, and if we do get a diagnosis of chronic endometritis, what will our treatment be? Uh, that's a good point, Erdal, because uh, this is not a new concept. And, and the man I have on my right side, Dr. Fatemi, published a long time ago a paper about probably 700 hysteroscopies. And what they were doing is taking a biopsy and then treating the patient and then looking at the results afterwards. And they found that chronic endometritis diagnosed by that biopsy and the hysteroscopy had no correlation at all, correct me if I'm wrong, no correlation at all with implantation failure. The problem is, what do we call chronic endometritis? Do we call CD138 positive cells, the image that we see in the hysteroscopy, the conventional culture, or the molecular microbiology? And this is what this paper tries to dissect. And what they say is that with the classical way of doing culture or CD138 or hysteroscopy, we're going to miss a lot of chronic endometritis 
that we can get by molecular uh, diagnosis. Again, okay, you diagnose the, the chronic endometritis that you can do in the previous cycle, but then you have to do something. Then you should give antibiotics, and there's no trial showing that by giving antibiotics, this molecular biology diagnosed chronic endometritis is going to change anything. So we are at the very early stages of trying to understand what are these new tests, and we are jumping into treatments when we still do not know if what we are diagnosing is really beneficial for the patient or not. So my suggestion would be if you want to test, because you need to test in case that particular patient requires the test, do it in the previous cycle, and if you find the chronic endometritis by molecular biology, just treat her with, with the antibiotic that you would use, doxycycline, doxycycline probably twice per day, 100 milligrams for 10 days could be useful, that you can do, you know, there are a lot of, of uh, ways that you can treat her, but, but if you, again, if you find something that you diagnose, you have to treat her. So you have to be very careful who you try to diagnose. This is my, my, my example always is vitamin D. And if you measure, you have to be ready to supplement in case it's low. So this is the same. If you take a biopsy or you do a hysteroscopy and you find something, you have to be ready to defend what you found and probably treat her. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much. Uh,